Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm Stephen Lewis. I'm a fellow in Asian Studies here at the Baker Institute for Public Policy. Oop, and I'm director of our Asian Studies program and a very klutzy director of our Asian Studies program. But I'd like to thank you all for coming and to welcome you to the Baker Institute and to Rice. And I'd also like to thank all the people who helped bring our speaker this evening uh, to campus and the many supporters of our Transnational China Project. If I may, although I risk embarrassing her, I'd like to especially thank Ping Sun for helping us bring uh, Da Chen, an old friend, to campus. And uh, looking out, I see many familiar faces in the audience this evening. And so as many of you may know, our Transnational China Project has been looking at changes in contemporary Chinese culture since 1997, working with our university faculty, some of which I also see in the audience, who are trying to look at the way these many changes in Chinese culture have occurred under globalization and the integration of China with the rest of the world. And as just one part of this project, we've invited distinguished and authoritative writers, poets, artists, and performers to come and share their views on recent changes in Chinese culture. And these have included over the years writers such as Wang Meng, Bai Xianyong, Yu Hua, uh, the poets Yu Guangzhong and Ya Xian most recently, as, mil, as well as many who have come to call the United States their home, including the musician Liu Suala, the artist Xu Bing, and tonight's speaker, Da Chen. Uh, I, I, just by way of an introduction, I think perhaps the best way to introduce you to Da Chen is to refer to his first books, which have become best sellers, widely used as texts in high schools and universities throughout the United States. Colors of the Mountain, which was published in 2001, recounts the story of his family's struggle to survive as a landowning family from rural Fujian province in southern China during the very tumultuous Great Proletarian Culture Revolution. Sounds of the River, which is published in 2003, relates his journey to China's capital to study at the elite Beijing Languages and Cultural University, uh, where he so excelled at the study of English, he was asked to stick around and become a faculty member. And, uh, the Sounds of the River ends with Da preparing to go to the United States to teach and to study, and indeed he then went on to come to the United States, and then also to enter and to graduate from Columbia University Law School, where he became a, a somewhat practicing lawyer for a short period of time working in the banking field, and then uh, moved on to his, uh, his other passions. And as we will no doubt hear tonight in his talk, Da Chen's literary talents and interests are definitely unique. He has both a hand and a voice that allows him, I would say, to become a, an intimate friend of his readers and his audience, uh, and those of many backgrounds in particular. Uh, he has also created a version of Colors of the Mountain for younger readers, and he's written original stories for them as well, including Wandering Warrior, which was published in 2003. His newest book, Brothers, which you saw outside, is his foray into adult fiction. We've asked him to come and share with us uh, these unique experiences as a Chinese writer who's come to stand at the top of the American publishing world. And the title of his talk is From China to Random House. And he's told me that after his talk, he will provide us with some time to have question and answer. And I'd like to ask you uh, to please uh, speak up and perhaps we'll have some microphones as well because this is being webcast uh, to uh, actually all parts of the world. Uh, a lot of our talks in the past have been picked up by China scholars in classrooms in you know, rural Australia, Lithuania, uh, even Texas. And so uh, these are these are wonderful resource for people studying contemporary Chinese literature. So please join me in welcoming Da Chen. Thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Lewis. And um, I'm so honored to be here tonight. Uh, and I wouldn't be able to stand here without the friendship from uh, long ago, my friend, dear friend, Pin San, whom I classmated with uh, in China once, and then at Columbia University Law School. And um, she, uh, has always been an inspiration because uh, when she was in our college during that time, uh, she was uh, extraordinary and she continues to be extraordinary when I hear that uh, she, um, when I see what she has 
uh, become um, this China flower blossoming in a under the huge Texas sky, uh, if I may say so, um, I wasn't surprised, but I was pleased, very happy about that. And I want to thank uh, President uh, David Lebron. Uh, in his absence, he's uh, having a good time touring Asia with uh, Education Secretary, uh, dealing with very, very important, mighty issues of international education. Uh, and we leave that to him. <laughs> and I, uh, Mr. Lebron and Pien had always, have always been my friend. Um, I remember them throwing me a dinner party, picking ducks and all, uh, at their beautiful apartment in New York at Columbia when I graduated, the day I graduated from Columbia Law School. And I remember um, sitting in David's office um, seeking advice as to how a law student could transform himself into an investment banker because I got the job and I was now getting very nervous about it. And, P and, Lee, uh, and uh, David was giving me advice and he uh, later recalled that, Da, you seem very nervous then. I was, yeah, I was. And um, there, were, uh, there were friends, but there are friends like Ping, which are few. And I think Ping comes in a one in a million, but in my case, I could say that I know a lot of people and I come from a country that is in billions. Um, she is one in a billion. And uh, I'm not overstating it. Anyone who knows her will know her sincerity, her uh, good heartedness. I was asking, I was talking to her father and I was trying to figure out how she, he raised her to be so extraordinary, uh, especially um, during those difficult time and difficult uh, place, but she seems regal and there is certain nobility to her. I was wondering maybe in another time she could have been Chinese emperors. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I, I would like to turn this entire talk into the organizational uh, meeting for the PIM nominating committee from <laughs> Supreme Court of Justice or uh, ambassador, and the ambassadorship to China or president of the United States American, but she wasn't born here. So uh, <laughs> we will have to have uh, rely on Arnold Schwarzenegger to change the constitution <laughs> so that PIM could muscle her in herself into the presidency. <laughs> <laughs> and what a friend, I mean, devoting such a busy, busy, important person devoting three years, I mean three days, three years, my goodness, yeah. I'm going crazy, yeah. Words mangled, you know, word mangled. It's like computer and keyboards getting all tied up. Um, and um, three days devoting to me, driving me around. I, I feel unworthy uh, and I, uh, but uh, as I wrote in the last chapter of my new novel, Brothers, I said that uh, grace sometimes is in receiving as well as giving. So uh, when she gives, I should receive it because otherwise it will be, uh, it uh, is not grace, otherwise it's not uh, right. So it's all right to receive from Sandovi if somebody who really, really gives. And, and last night, uh, and I'm not last night, when I had, uh, I Ping kept telling everybody that I um, sold out all the books uh, at uh, Houston Chronicles um, annual, uh, 27th and annual authors and books um, fundraising event. I don't know how they picked me. I was uh, got a phone call and and he they said that uh, oh da you are you're gonna be uh, there with uh, Alex Kasunsky of New York Times style writer a beautiful 
woman and style writer, style maker in New York, I guess, and then co-founder of、um, Apple Computers, and Kathy Wrights of a enormously successful thriller writer,、uh, creator of a, a Fox TV show called Bones, which my children love, which is an indication that it's very popular, and another. A legendary writer from Texas called Mr. Curtis, and why Da Chen? I couldn't figure out. But uh, um, it looks like uh, it's my year, and <laughs> and we believe in fate. Maybe that's just you know、uh, your ship somehow had sailed to this dock.、And、there are docks in your life, and our lives are. Rivers, it flows, uncharted rivers, and it, it goes never in a straight line, always zigzagging like rivers. Never know where we are going. We might know that we'll definitely have particular cereal with cold milk for breakfast, but beyond that, very few things are predictable.、Uh, least of which your life, which you think you have such. Great control over. I、uh, I want to thank Baker Institute. I'm a great admirer of Mr. Baker's、uh, career, and I really、uh, thought that he、uh, stood for something when he represented、uh, President Bush's、uh, camp during a very trying period.、Uh, Of the first election, when I looked at his face, I、um, I saw wisdom. I saw American. I saw a certain strength. And、uh, what an honor to be standing here, where uh, um, many many Chinese artists, Chinese.、Uh, the first inaugural speech speaker here was Mr. Wang Men, Honorable Wang Men, who was. An author, best-selling author,、um, a most popular author, leading the pack of expose literature right after Cultural Revolution, and he was selected to be the Minister of Culture in China, and、um, I'm humbled by that.、Uh, I grew up reading Wang Men and、um, many, many, many sovereign sorrow stories, and.、Um, It's a、uh, honor I、uh, hardly deserve, but here I am、um, deserving it. <laughs>、um, I、um, I grew up in、um, some of you have read my memoir, but I grew up in a really uh, uh, poor part of China, a、uh, southern part of China. If you know China, Chinese map, Chinese map is in the. Imagine Chinese map to be in the shape of a rooster,、um, facing the Pacific Ocean, the beak facing the Pacific Ocean. Beijing will be somewhere near the Pacific, near the, the neck, and、uh, Shanghai somewhere near the、uh, chest. Fujian Province, where my village、uh, is located, is near the belly button, and that's where it is.、Uh, it was nestled right between mountain to the west. And see to the east. It was a、uh, uh, pastoral, pastoral、um, in that sense. Everything was ancient in that way. Land was ancient. Rivers were old. Mountain, legendary, tall and mighty. And、uh, we、uh, subsisted on what land produces along that. A、uh, narrow strip of land between the mountain and the river, numb the mountain and the sea, for generations and generations. It was an, it's a, it's a, it's a village of isolation. It was isolated from the rest of China by so many layers of mountains, and、uh, I think emperors used to call Fujian as the rotten toll of China, as long as you pay. Levies and taxes, in grains and in treasures, in all the 
delicacies. Ah,、uh, he couldn't care less about what happened to them. That therefore, Fujian has always been known as a、uh, the province of pirates and rogues and and all that sort of stuff. So um. But it was pastoral. I was using a a very beautiful terminology, term, beautiful word, and I could imagine Beethoven composing enormously beautiful violin concerto、uh, from that setting. If Beethoven Beethoven were not starving, and、uh, but the time was really difficult. Um, I was、um, born a、uh, member of a born in the family of a、uh, former landowner who、uh, owned、uh, some land in a the village. And in 1949, when the commun communists came,、uh, communist red armies marched from up north down to the south to.、Uh, To our village, my grandfather surrendered the deeds to our land that our family had been in our family、um, for generations. He had no choice but to do that because his brother-in-laws, his my grandmother's、um, brothers, three brothers, did not do that. They did not kneel down in front of the general. And surrender the deeds to their land, and they were shot by a pistol in their head, one by one. Three brothers died within minutes. Their blood flooding the earthen floor of the little room where they were last executed. And that's why each time I um I read about um、uh, how the end, the tragic ending of the、uh, Russian Tsar's family. It, It, uh, he always threatened to. Uh, um, um, I always felt like I was about to vomit because there's that that this the fishiness of the blood. I could I could feel it, and I each time my grandmother recalled it, I could I was just f-、uh, cringing and and with、um, and she always was so shaken because these were the her only siblings. So my my grandfather was. Was、uh, learned smart. He、um, he surrendered the deeds to the army and、uh, opened the door to our house to welcome the armies to stay in our house and hoping that、uh, we're making good terms and that you will treat us the Chen's well. But uh, but uh, the country was so caught up in political、um, craze and madness. That countries was thrust ever since 1949 from one political movement to another,、um, and my family, my father and my grandfather became what we called political athletes. During each political movement, may it be the leftist purge or great leap forward, they were always taken into prison to be. To suffer from the humiliation parade, to be getting to be beaten up, and that sort of thing. And、um, many people, some people, I was in、uh, San Francisco.、Uh, I was in San Francisco speaking to a in a town hall about five hundred people there,、uh, right after publication of a、uh, brother. I mean, Colors of Mountain, and I was just talking about that. And there was a guy. There was a guy, a Chinese guy from Milan, China, was just screaming at me, cursing,、uh, calling my name. And、um, he had to be walked out by police, by the to, to a security guard. And it seems like I've broken this code because I've spoken. And it was a、uh, not to be spoken. It was something. To be hidden. Let's not talk about it. But I could not help talking about it because I had witnessed as a child, and what you witness led you who you are, and who you are is what matters to who I am. And I cannot 
at some point hold back what I saw, and what I saw was was horrendous, and what I saw was was not easy for a child to see. Remember a day when I uh, I still remember that particular day in the Princeton Princeton of my childhood. I was an innocent young boy, skinny country boy, sunken bellies, always hungry because our province was very vulnerable, was in the mouth, right in the path of typhoons. And each time typhoon blew through ruthlessly, an entire season of harvest will be lost, and we will go hungry. And one of the phrases I feared the most was, "Tighten your belt." I still remember I had a belt that I had made as I grew older and taller. I got skinnier. I had to make so many more holes to it. And I remember that 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 belt I inherited from my brother who gave it to me. It was pork leather. I could loop around twice, and at some point I could loop around three times. When I was really, really hungry, and、uh, we ate all sort of things and moldy yams, my 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 family couldn't afford to、uh, so ever since. And then, my father lost his job as a teacher because he was not politically good enough to be a teacher, to be a school teacher. So now he had a family of nine, he and his wife, two Asian parents, and five kids. I was the youngest of which. And there was no job, no money, no land, no property. So we couldn't,、uh, and then、uh, we didn't have any money to buy anything, the food or anything, especially when there was a shortage of food. And I still remember our old house,、um, and my parents begin to sell. The doors inside the house, the doors. So our house had many doors inside the house, but all the doors were taken out. So it just became a sort of cave-like hole in a wall, and、um, and even that could not give you enough ma enough money to buy food. So、um, my mother always went to the market, took me with me, and to go to the market to bargain to buy the moldy yams. We couldn't afford rice because the rice was so precious. I, I tell you, you you would not want to waste one grain of rice in front of my mother. She will kill you. That's how sacred it is to us. It was it was always sacred to Chinese people because rice is heaven. Rice is everything. But to her especially, um. So she couldn't. Afford to buy the rice, so she would use the little money that we had after selling the doors and the chairs, and then later on the tables, and、uh, to buy not the yams, sweet potatoes, which we grew in more abundance. She could only afford to buy the moldy yams, the one that was growing bad, and that one that was sprouting with green leaves and that sort of stuff. And、uh, it was good, and, and it was cheaper. My mother would cut away the moldy part, and then boil it in the water. And she would keep the little sprouts because then you have food and vegetable all in one pot. And、um, we would eat that, and we would eat that. I still remember one year we ate that for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner. That way for three months. And we were lucky to be eating that soupy, moldy yam. And my brother said one day, summer sum it up really well when he said that, you know,、uh, I'm really sick of it. <laughs> yeah, moldy yam for breakfast, moldy yam for lunch, for dinner. But I can't imagine having no moldy yam tomorrow. And we don't even have enough moldy yam to fill our stomach. My mother will pour so much water in it, so you get some sort of sweetness out of it. You fill yourself up to here, 
and keep burping, but there's really nothing it here. And um, those were our childhood. And one day, and we were, uh, but notwithstanding all those uh, hunger and, and all that, childhood was still innocent and was still beautiful. The leaves were green, cigars were crying, fish we catch, and many, many wonderful things in nature, and many, many things we write on the back of water buffalo, we roll our little boat, catch crabs and eels, uh, and catfish as well. But, uh, and one day when I, was, I was playing in the street with my friends, and we were playing, we we're playing, and then suddenly my friend said to me, you know, Da, you gotta go, go to see this. Something is very exciting is happening in commune's headquarter. And commune's headquarter in our village was located in one of the two churches built by American missionaries in their 20s. That's how far they have gone into the fabrics of Chinese country. And now it became uh, the, the house of political meetings and torture. So as soon as we heard, we were so, there was no TV, there was no, no electricity, no nothing. Anything could be entertaining. So we, uh, we ran and we ran to the, go to the communist headquarters looking for fun, looking to feel our empty head. So I climb up this stained glass window, climb to the to the tallest tallest window, trying to get 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 the best view. And uh, and everybody seems like the entire village full of kids were there. They were all hanging off the windows and walls and watching things going on, spectacle unfolding, drama unfolding within the commune's headquarters. And there were someone getting hung by both thumbs to the ceiling, two feet barely touching the floor, and five militia men were beating savagely this man with their rifle butts, and they were going at it, going at it, uh, slamming his back, his head, and this man was crying. I've never heard such a piercing cry by an adult. Uh, to hear adult cry was one of the most, most unnerving, unnerving thing for a child to hear. And I was nine years old. And I was looking like, what, what was that? But nonetheless, kids were cheering because it was entertainment. It was something that was unusual. But then, when the sea wind blew through the windows, and that rope swiveled over. And I saw my father's face. He had never seen him cry. And he was the tower of strength. He was, he was love. He was heaven and earth. He was everything to me. He was the man I look up to, I love. And he is now crying crying, begging for his life, and he's crying like an animal, like a beast. He was getting beaten up, and there was trace of blood just going down his corner of his mouth, and he was to see a man in tears, and especially when the man was your father. It was the most unforgettable moment of my life. I felt that heaven caved in on me, that hope was all gone, that sunlight was suddenly sucked out of the earth, darkness prevailing. I felt all these strange emotions that I never experienced before, never ever experienced before. I held the most most noticeably emotion of fear, of hopelessness. I felt like I was drowning, I was drowning. I was, I was running out of last breath and drowning. There was a sensation and I've, I could smell the blood 
I could smell the blood, the blood that was shed from my great grand uncles when they were executed, and that return, the cycle begins to reappear again. And I slowly slide down from the top of the window. Slide down, and I crouch on the root of of the wall, the, of the wall, to collect myself while all the children were looking at me and say, "That's your dad." And silently and fiercely and gingerly, as if my footfall would wake up and frighten the earth. I walked on the shady side of the street. Shady side. I was ashamed of myself, ashamed of something, something big, something shameful, something hurtful, something sad, something mournful, was descending upon me. I dare not walk on the side where the sun was shining, because I did not. Did not deserve the sun. I knew there was something I didn't do that I should have done. And that trip, that trip home, it was was the longest. I wanted to go rush home to tell my mother about it. Tell my mother the father was dying. The father could die that day because the way they were beating him, he will die very soon. I knew that because. I have seen dogs getting beaten up by people in the country road when they were rounding up the dogs because these dogs were eating up food the communes didn't have, and men turned to dogs. They start eating dogs, and they that's I have seen dogs getting beaten up just this going at it, going at it until the god just go limp. I've seen that, and that's exactly what was happening happening to my father. To equate dog to my father and father to my dog, I quickened my feet. But it was also the shortest. I couldn't wait to get home to tell my mother. Maybe there was something we could do to save father. And it was also the shortest trip because I could not bear the moment when I have to tell mother that I didn't do anything. To try to save father. I mean, I've grown up reading, hearing about brave stories of how sons come to the rescue of their father when their father are in need, and my father was in a deadly need of a son's rescue. Why couldn't I leap through the stained glass, broken window? Take him away, like a Superman. Why couldn't I shout it out angrily? Stop! Stop! You animals! Stop killing my father! But I didn't do anything. I was silent. I was a coward, and I knew that. And that day, that was a tragic day. But that was also a day I,、uh, I didn't cry when I saw my mother. My mother was sobbing, but I didn't cry. I knew that if father was going to die, I should be a man today. So I could take care of my mother. My mother was so petite, seemed so vulnerable. Each time, tragic occurrences. Take place in our household. She knows only two things to do: and cry, as all the women in that God's forsaken country know to do so well. They cry silently. They try to swallow the bitterness, the pain inside. Because expressing it does not. Invoke sympathy. He invoke disgust, and he cry and he cry and cried in their own privacy. 
until the day their tears dry, or until the day they die, until the day they then kill themselves, or poison themselves, or hunt themselves, or leap off the cliff. I didn't cry, and I told my mother about it. My mother said she knew it was because that day my father had received a letter from my uncle from Taiwan, and Taiwan was supposed to be an enemy of China, mainland China, communist rule, and that the act of correspondence and receiving the letter, opening the letter, reading the letter, letter from the only brother he had. Was an act of betrayal to the communist cause, an act of spying for Taiwanese government, therefore for Americans CIA. And I was brave that day. I、um, said to my mother, "I said maybe we can pray. Go to pray to Buddha. That was hidden, the little statue broken." Buddha with one arm, the only Buddha statue that we were able to hide behind in the behind a curtain in the attic that Mother prays to every day. I say maybe we should pray to Buddha, and I lit an incense stick for her. Usually she does that. Usually she had to ask me to do that. And we climb up the stairs. I helped her, and we pray, and we pray. Father didn't die that day, and I thought it was our prayer that saved him. But you know what?、Uh, it wasn't all bad. It wasn't really all bad, all sad. Childhood was still,、um, still always good until it gets bad, and、uh, I still remember people always ask me.、Um, What what are the good things and good things? And I could share with you one good thing, which is、uh, I uh, we uh, we love we love、uh, watching movies. But as you know, without electricity, motion pictures doesn't happen. So,、uh, but every year we always manage to see one movie. Always manage to see one movie, at least, and. We could only afford one, and that was always during the Chinese New Year, Spring Festival, which always falls a month or so after after a regular calendar year, calendar New Year. And excuse me, the money is your family will your parents will give you money, 压岁钱 we call in red bag, and this money we call 压岁 to、uh, money given in coins. Weighty, heavy. We're supposed to weigh you down, the children down, earthbound, so you won't be taken away by the evil、uh, angels. That was the, the theory. And we'll be given this money, and we will be so happy. We'll think of so many things that we could do. We could buy candies. We buy this, and we could buy that. But the thing that came most powerfully to us was we have to go see a movie. We have to see a movie because we'll be suffer. We'll be so suffocated in this little village. All we saw was cow manure. All we saw was dog doing dogs. You know, cow doing dogs. You know, and and and, and that was entertainment enough within the framework of a、uh, yellow storm. But we need more. We want more. We might be hungry in our bellies, but our mind, our big head, was full of dreams. Big head was full of desire. And that desire was no less potent than desire of a boy from Texas or from Houston or from Maine, Blue Hill, Maine, or from Lansing, Michigan, or from Spokane, Seattle. It was the same. As powerful, we won the mountains. We reached for the sky, and we will go to the deepest depth. Of the ocean, because we are the children of the world, and we deserve that. We deserve at least to hope 
to dream for that, and I did. So we、uh, decided to go to、uh, the big town, a bigger town, who which had a movie theater, and the bigger town. We have to walk for two to three hours, depending on how fast you walk or how fast you run.、Um, but no matter how daunting it was, we love that challenge. We love that opportunity because we are now armed with this little money in our pocket, and we pin our pockets, we tie our pockets inside, twist it, so when we run, the quarters will not pop out preciously. I mean, if they do, if they popped out, we'd probably jump into the river and drown ourselves. That would be how devastating it is. And we, we little yellow stoners, we kids, we get a group together because we're very afraid of going to the big cities now. Big city, two hours away, walking. You know, frightened, beautiful city people, and、um, we're the little one, and suddenly. Our little universe becomes small and the big one, and we are now transferring ourselves、um, into that arena, and that was scary. That was scary. So we walked in the group, and we sometimes ran, and we ran as fast as we could until our feet got really tired, and then we rest, and we rest, and we run again, because we don't want to be late for the movies in the big city. We don't want to be late for it, and invariably, by the time we got there, we always late. And invariably, there this ticket. It seems like the same ticket lady, ageless, smoking the same cigarette, open the cranky window, and puff into our face. You're late again, yellow stoners. You bunch of losers.、Um, And we are don't mind being loser and all, just as long as let let us in. And she said the movie is already in progress. Did I do something? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, that's right.、Uh, <laughs> magic of motion picture, yeah. And we said we didn't mind, please.、Uh, and she said, well, you're too late. Like I said, the movie is already in progress and.、Uh, Uh, we said, "Well, well, you sold all the seating tickets. Well, how about the standing tickets?" She said, "Well, no, standing tickets were sold long before seating tickets." And we said, "Oh, then how about the window tickets?" They said, "Well, window tickets are we were even sold earlier than the standing tickets. We have a lot of windows on the side, and people would climb up like monkeys, hang onto the ledge, and you know, had a great view. You get a great view doing that. But they were sold long before that, and we say, 'Oh.'" No, not again. And、um, I mean, we were sweating, and we were, we could kill ourselves. And we say, "Oh, flat feet! Why don't we run a little faster, huh? Why does that tractor have to throw us off the back of their, of their uh, uh, trunk?" And then,、uh, in that particular year. This lady suddenly opened the window and said, "You know, you guys look really pathetic." I'm going to. I do have an idea. For half price, I'm going to take you to the back of the stage. And we, we didn't hear the other part when you heard half price. So we give them three pennies, you know, untwisting our inside of our pocket and say three pennies. That's great. Three pennies. Let's go. And the lady said, "Ah,、oh. and we um." Started walking inside this theater, and people were slapping our legs because it was so crowded, and people were all smoking. The place was hazy and smoky, and uh, and uh, finally we got to the back of the stage, and we were crouching there. And movie theater, this wide screen was right in front of us, this close because this close to us, and we we're right behind it. At the very beginning, everything seemed left-handed. Everybody was talking funny, and left-handed. And、uh, these big loudspeakers were right to our ears, and we were being in a zone. You know, we were bombarded by this、uh, everything, and、um, and we were getting dizzy. I think it was the smoke that we inhale, or or the the closeness to the the thing. And that particular movie was called a、uh, communist nurse from Shanghai. 
It was a very sexy movie, I tell you. Yeah, we all went all the way just to see that because、uh, she was known to be a a huge starlet, and with very long legs and creamy skin, and she wears a skirt on it, and we love that because we never know what skirts look like, and we want to see communists from Shanghai. And we are、uh, we were right there. We were right, you know. It was a great sensation because you were、uh, we were right under the screen, and we had a sensation that we had we were in the movie, and we were right under the skirt of communists from Shanghai. <laughs> Where a nine-year-old yellow stoner always wanted to be. And the magic. Of motion picture took over. We forgot where we were. We forgot we were really, really ugly Yellowstone people. That we were really pathetic. That we would have to run for another three hours, try to race with the sun before it sets. We forgot who we were. We became a part of the cinema. And that magic would be good for us for the next entire year. Then we'll be talking about the nurse from Shanghai for a long time to come. I love that movie. That was my favorite movie. I tell you, it beats Julia Roberts and all that stuff. Communist, communist nurse from Shanghai. Check that one out. So those were wonderful things, good things. And then,、um, how how do I come to write? People always ask. You were, you know, Wall Street banker and etc. and etc. And、um, I,、uh, you know, at some time, at some point in your life,、uh, things come to past, come to catch up with you. And you know, I my my past, all those poverty, all those things, seeing your father humiliate, and you know, I took all that, took all that. It's an unfortunate thing was that I took all that suffering, took all their pain, all that starvation. Seeing, I mean, I have seen, I have seen women dead, hang by the rope in a neck. Again, it was sort of entertainment, and there it seems like a lot of women committed suicide. That's why the opening scene of the book was a woman leaping off the cliff. It was not far fetched. One woman did, raped by a cadre, too humiliated to live on, couldn't get rid of the baby. What do you do? Jump off the cliff. And I uh. I was in an environment where you don't boast about poverty and starvation and all those sort of things. I was at the, I was at the Columbia, you know, and、uh, hobnobbing with the major league people.、Um, I was very, very intimidated. I was very, very, very afraid because、uh, I think a third of the classmates had graduated from、uh, Ivy League university, including Ping. You, you, you Ivy Leaguers, yeah, scared the heck out of me, yeah. And the other third who had gone to Ivy League had gone to either Oxford or Cambridge or Lon- London Economics.、Um, London Economics. What do they do there? I ask them, what do they do there? Drinking hot beer, they say. <laughs> That tastes like a horse piss. <laughs> But they came back, you know, drunk and hang, having a year-long、uh, hangover and French cuff. You know, they, so one of my friends became Mr. French Cuff, David the French Cuff. Everywhere he go, he wears French cuff. Where did you pick it up? London economics, yeah. <laughs> London economics, horse piss beer. So, um, um, and you have to pretend. See, life is all about pretending. Like today, you know, I'm wearing this such a I, 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 such a nice suit, and you know, for the first time this afternoon, I was at Brussels, and one of the lady come up to to me and said, "You are a priest now, right?" 
It was the second time they said that. And I just want to share with you, it's, it's not really, uh, I don't deserve to be a priest. That's a holy job and not holy. And I don't have a job. <laughs> um, this, this is Shanghai 10, Medicine 63rd, Manhattan. Check it out. Tailored. My wife have it tailored so that I don't grow fat. Yeah. She said, you can't grow. And this is my wife's idea of having me dress like this. She said that um, you should try to dry, dress more Chinese, more like a Chinese, yes. And I said, am I not looking Chinese enough for you? <laughs> it's my yellow hair growing. And then she also uh, got me these boots. I know that I talk about Prada boots all the time. These are Prada boots. And uh, really nice, you know, shiny. Oh, I'm kicking. And dancing boots, yeah. Anyway. And uh, it's also her idea. And that has to do with the fact that uh, um, my wife, who was born, it was, was an ABC. She's a sunny, beautiful wife. I love her. Uh, miss her, too. Um, well, I'm on tour. She, uh, she's an ABC, American-born Chinese. And ABC are just wonderful people. Uh, they, uh, they look Chinese and they are Eng American all inside. You know, the, way, the package is perfect. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. And uh, she, uh, she uh, and I, you know, during our, our courting days and, and throughout our marriage, we, I always share with her the glimpse of my childhood. But one thing always come up, you know, the phrase that I never owned a pair of shoes until I was nine years old. I, I never did. And, and I mentioned so many times that one day she said, you know, Da, I'm really sick of you mentioning that all the time. Sick and tired of nine-year-old no shoes thing. Let's go to a Prada store and buy a pair of shoes and shut up about that. <laughs> and I did. And I did. And... Uh, why did I write? I, uh, I, I had. A, I think the reason was fatherly. I, uh, when, when Victoria, our daughter, who is now twelve, turning twelve on Saturday, when she uh, was about four or five years old, uh, one day she said, "Da, Daddy, we are you really an alien?" And that was a weighty thing for her to be asking me because uh, she. Um, she had reason to do so. First of all, I have a strange name. My name is unlike any of her friends' uh, names. David, William, Bill, and Doc, Joe. Uh, there is Da. So she always whispered, my dad's name is Da. Sounds like Dada, Da, 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 Da. And secondly, um, my childhood, my, my, my wife's childhood uh, was meticulously recorded in piles and piles of uh, childhood, colorful childhood albums. Life was full of beginnings, full of first recitals and second swim meet, and a third dance competition, and a fourth violin winning, and all that. And she could follow that progress, the growing of her mother. In so doing, she saw herself in that shadow. It's a mother-daughter thing. And she wanted to do that with me, but she couldn't because my childhood was captured in two or three black and white photos only. And those are bad photos, grainy, you know. You know, I was looking skinny somewhere in the background. There's all sort of weird things in a photo. And black and white. And, you know, some of these photos actually always, now that I look back, it, it looks, looks suspiciously, look, I look, you know, it look like, these photos look like some of the, you know, the photos you see in tabloid of a, you know, a, a, a Bigfoot vanishing into a forest. And, or, um, or someone uh, catching a glimpse of, um, the UFO, um, 
uh, at the prairie, at sunlight, at sunset, and it was uh, really uh, enough to cause a young child to be suspicious of where you come from. And uh, I could explain that because all those black and white photos, even those were precious. The only link to my childhood. Um, and it was a tough time. Nobody could afford cameras, less uh, films. So um, I still remember uh, one year there was a nasty guy who walked around uh, the village taking picture of people and I was I, I remember posing for him and he was asking everybody to pose. I mean the good deal was too good to be true. Asking everybody to pose and I, I did pose and I stood sort of you know like a revolutionary. I pushed out my chest, you know, my face was facing the sun and I was standing standing right by the bridge and and, and, and the wave you know the river was running. It was a really beautiful day. And months later, months went by, nothing came. And I kept saying, this fellow, and one day I stopped him and said, hey, you know what, you took my picture, remember me? Remember me? He was much older than I was. He was a late teens and I was a young boy. And he said, yeah, yeah, I remember you were a fool. Um, and I said, well, what do you mean fool? You took my pictures, remember? That day you took my pictures. He said, yeah, I took your pictures, but there was no film in it. And I said, oh, but you did? I, I didn't understand that you need to have a film. I just thought, you know, you clicked and something came out. And I said, no, no, I saw you click twice, remember? Twice, and, and, and you did it pretty seriously. And I was serious too. We were doing business there. And, you know, we were doing a picture. You clicked and I posed and I was smiling, I remember. And I was smiling good also, and, and the sun was on my face, remember? I was pushed out my chest and, and all sort of things. And you could see my ribs as well. And, and, and he said, um, he said, you know, you, you get lost, you know, you are a fool, you are so stupid. Uh, there's no film there, I was fooling you around, okay? And so we, uh, we, learn, we learn that if you really want to have your photo taken, the only way is to jump into a photo session when other people were really taking a photo. And I did that once. I, uh, someone was, his family was having an engagement photo session and I, uh, my father's friend was taking a photo, this thing, you know, hiding under it, you know, he was, he was like a magician, he was doing this, click that, click this, click that. And I was just buying my time, I was standing, you know, gauging the situation, you know, see where I can squeeze in at the last moment. And then he was all there. He said, one, two, you know, Chinese version of cheese. I don't know what that is. Yeah. Sticky cake. Yeah. Um, and at the last moment, I leaped into the picture. <laughs> I really did. And I was uh, flying into it. I was, you see it ah, in fly, you know, <laughs> in flight. And my, my edges, my face and ear all blurry. You know, I looked like a monkey with hairs and everything. And I was in this way. I was going this way on the way to the floor. And, and, and this happy family in shock, turning 30 degrees <laughs> in shock, in jaws all long, fallen. And, and, I'm, I, I, and then the, the photographer would have killed me had he not been my father's friend. And, and later, later he developed the film for me and then uh, the, the picture for me and uh, dump on the table in our family and say, look how ugly you look. Look how ugly you look. I just want, I print it out so that you can learn a lesson. Don't ever do this again because someone else will kill you. Will kill you. And that's the kind of thing. So I, I um, and I wanna, I mean, I could tell my daughter that Dad wasn't an alien. I didn't come from the First World War. I lived a parallel life in time, in space, almost, with your mother. Didn't come from another world. I wasn't off another planet. I am the human species. Or you would be something else too. 
And I could tell her, I could have told her that、uh, I had come from a terrible place during a terrible time, and summarily so, dismissing her suspicion. But that would not be fatherly, and I. That's how I come to write my childhood story, which came to be become Colors of the Mountain. And、um, ever since the publication of the book, I have been to so many cities in this country promoting, and somehow I become the story. The books become me. People know me. You know, in other situations where an author is an author, you really don't care who he is. It's just you love the books that you are.、Um, he or she writes, and but in this case, the moment <laughs> I really should be shouldn't be a f- fiddling with this stuff, yeah. <laughs> James Bond, <laughs> yeah, something might explode or leap out, right? So um. Um, but in my case, people are、uh, really relate to my story, and they see me as the book, book as me. And、uh, I have received letters from all over the world.、Uh, this book has sold hundreds of thousands of copies worldwide. I have received some wonderful letters. I re- most unusual letter I received from a Norwegian fisherman. He said, "I wrote three letters in my life. I'm a retired fisherman living off an isolated island. I read an English version of your book, and I just want you to know that you come from a corner, a tiny corner of the world, and I too. But we connect. And this is the third letter I wrote to anyone, less to any authors. I want to thank you. The previous letter was about forty years ago when I." Proposed to my wife. It touches him. It brought something out of him. And everywhere I go, people say how wonderful your parents are, how wonderful your mother was, how strong, how wonderful your father was. There was a book club in Ohio. They had a ritual. After reading a book, they always vote to see. Who among the characters in the book that they would like to take out for lunch? And the letter said that sorry to tell you, Dad, it's not you. <laughs> it's your mother. <laughs> And I'm grateful. I'm grateful because my father has passed away. I couldn't do anything for him materially, physically anymore. And my mother, who has been living with with us, she doesn't even speak English, but he's being to to her, she is being mutely discussed, and praised and loved. That woman deserved to be praised, to be loved. And I say, you know, my parents gave me my birth, raised me. But I give them immortality, and to that I am eternally grateful to America, to the generosity of this great country, who would champion someone like me, who came from another shore, who came with nothing, but a heart full of hope, like Random House always to say. Da came to America at age twenty-three. With thirty dollars in a pocket and a heart full of hope, I did, and I salute Baker Institute. I salute Rice University. I salute Ping. I salute David in career, wherever he might be traveling, and I salute you. I salute the great Texas.、I、salute Houston. I love Houston, my favorite city. Now. And I salute, I salute America, and I hope the rest of the world will start stop bashing America, because we are really, 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 really decent people. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Yes. You know, uh, before that, can I play some flute for you? Yes. I'm not a Chinese James Cowway. Don't expect a Carnegie, Carnegie Hall quality performance. But I play because uh, my father taught me as a young boy how to play it, and it has become my companion, a constant companion. No matter where I go, I have journey here and there, from there to here, and no matter where I will be going next. This will always be with me. I have always brought it with me. I play everywhere I go. I play when I'm lonely. I play when I'm happy. I play when I'm sad. I play when I missed my father, and I play when I'm feeling nothing. And I play just wanting to honor my father. There's nothing I can do for him again. And as a son.、Um, Who carries his name? I want to mention his name again, and again. I want to invoke his name, his spirit. And I feel each time, no matter where I play, how badly I play, or how well I play,、um, I always feel that I always know that he's happy that I play, and I know that、um, he's proud of me because I play. Please close your eyes and follow me to China.
James Cowell or no Cowell. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for coming here to honor me. Any questions? Yeah, perhaps some questions. I was going to say, uh, one question. You know, growing up um, at that time in China, did you, was the equality between men and women something that you as a child saw, or how did that relationship work? I, um, women were very silent. They were, I mean, women in the Middle East, some of them wear this shroud, you know, the head cloth over it. But Chinese women wear an invisible one. In their psyche, in their emotions, they try to hide that. And uh, this device when they walk, not the city girls. And uh, that's why, um, I mean, part of China is still deep in a very traditional, traditional China. And that's why it's really extraordinary, even today, to see extraordinary, outstanding women like Ping and Kathy and Professor Chin. Chin, and Professor, and Dr. Wen, and and Miss uh, um, Zhao. <laughs> Zhao, exactly, Mrs. Zhao. It's extraordinary. We all know what we're talking about. We could be the victims, but they don't choose to be. They transcend. They all have great story to tell. I'll tell you. I was just looking at Ping's black and white photos when Ping was this big. <laughs> Cute little Ping. Can you imagine that? Yeah. She looked exactly like her daughter. Oh, her daughter looks exactly like her. <laughs> Continuity of humanity and generations, one wave of another, is, is really amazing. Um, but silence, that silence suffered by my mother. I was very close to my mother. I was the youngest child, and by then, um, I got to see a lot of my mother. My mother grew up around her knees, and she cooked, and she does all this, and then and she, she um, the way she takes things internal, not outside. And um, I don't know how they break out that mold and tear apart that invincible headscarf and be who they are today. Uh, it's a uh, compliment to their to humanity, to, to their achievement. And I sense very early on that, and yes, women walk behind men. They are not talking, they're eating like this. And in fact, in our um, and their big cities are very different. Women were very uh, much more aggressive, much more outgoing, much more ambitious, and more out outwardly so. And that was a shock for me when I went from a little village to go to college in Beijing. Um, because in our village, women were we don't even sit at the same table. Uh, wedding banquets, women were over there, and they, you could hear from villages, villages away, during a wedding, men were eating and drinking, and women were chopping the vegetables. You could hear the sound of them chopping, uh, because they prepare, help the chef prepare the food. Uh, you see all those things. But the most drastic thing was, uh, the transformation of girlhood, even into womanhood, it happens overnight. There's a girl here who wears modern clothes, the button right in the middle, like what we do now. And suddenly, after a wedding date, she begins to pull her hair back into a bun here. 
and then begin to wear the clothes that was buttoned on the along the right side of her chest. Dressed like a woman, like a married woman, and within that incident, she aged a decade. That always shocked me as a young child because this young bride who was 18 was very playful. Sometimes you even know them, know them to be playful, to be girlish. And two, two, days, two days later, she became a woman. And that, 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 that way very heavy in, in my, uh, in, I guess in my heart. I, um, um, and I have seen a lot of uh, men beating their wife. But I've also seen a uh, wife beating men too. <laughs> <laughs> I really did. Uh, men getting drunk and why there was one guy, one wife who was very uh, tough. <laughs> it was great, yeah. <laughs> And the man, that, he was fleeing, he was, he was running, and the wife was saying, never get out of here. You know? <laughs> it was fun. So you, you, it is a, there were strong women as well who, uh, who just, um, but in general, that was the thing, invisible headscarf. Yes. I have a question, Da. Um, you're so eloquent and observant. Um, have you written any poetry? And have you been, my second question is, have you been back home and how has it changed? I haven't um, done any poetry and I, I don't think I am a poet. Um, mm -hmm. I, uh, I'm not good enough to be a poet. Uh, uh, I have been home. I still remember the first time I was home, I was uh, working as a summer associate, summer, summer, uh, temporary lawyer for a law firm called Scattered Ops and uh, I went to Beijing to work for them and um, I uh, the first time I was back and uh, suddenly I am Mr. Chen this way and Mr. Chen that way and uh, and and I was given a, a, a driver to drive me around but but within two days I begin to feel ill fitting in in a suit that I I brought back from New York, and uh, I still wore the suit, but I gave up the, the car surface. I, I bought a bicycle, and the partner here in Skeleton Up said, how much does a bicycle cost? She was a little concerned. I said, well, it'll cost about, it'll be the cost of two cab ride, two, uh, two uh, you know, car surface trips. He said, well, buy 10. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and then I went to village, uh, visit our village, and the village was much changed. Uh, our village was small to begin with. It was plowed into, it became the basin of a Taiwanese investment. And if you are wearing uh, some Italian shoes or whatever it might be, I think nine out of 10 times, the chance is that um, it is made in Italy slashed Yellowstone. <laughs> yes, it's gone. The, the village was gone. Literally gone, and that's why these are the my old, old to my uh, my forever village, a place that will always occupy a very special spot in my heart. How did you end up uh, at Beijing University? Uh, it appears that the educational process did accord to you some opportunities. I am. Uh, I wrote that in uh, Colors of the Mountain, uh, in the 38 pages of the book, which uh, my editor said that, that reads like a thriller. How I study, how I study, how I study. I know it sounds very boring, but it was, there was a lot of things that going on. Uh, and uh, end of the Cultural Revolution, the schools we re were opened, and we all raised, tried to squeeze into those few and narrow doors that everybody tried to squeeze in. And uh, I hope you'll read Colors of Mountain. It's too long to explain. Yeah, that's why it takes a book to, to write it. Yeah. But that was the, that was the part that really, uh, it was recently uh, translated in, into Korean. 
language. And that's because Korean, and it became a bestseller in Korea because in Korea, all the children have to take the national examination. And the guy said that it's a great inspiration for the kids. They couldn't imagine this is what you have to do. But it, because of the book, a lot of people really say, you know what, I could do it too. Yes? I want to thank you with all my heart for speaking on behalf of us who grew up in the darkest years in China. Communist regime, I consider the worst regime in the Chinese history. Actually, my mom was beaten up the, the, the way that your father was beaten up. My mm. mom, tiny, little, vulnerable mm. young lady. She died two years after that mm. from wow. her wounds. Wow. You brought us all into tears when you talked about that part. Oh, thank you very much. I think it's our duty, our obligation, to tell the world how terrible this regime is. Because today, American government is trying to be friendly with this regime because of this economical gain. Right. Which I really feel bad about it. I'm so happy that Nancy Pelosi has been selected the speaker for the Congress because she knows that, she opposes that. Um, <coughs> but we also have uh, people like us here try to protect China with a nationalistic approach to think a strong China would give us faith in America, which I consider to be very, very wrong. You encounter this occasion in San Francisco. Could you please tell us exactly what you said offend, that offended this uh, terrible person? And how should we or and you do on occasions like this? Well, I was just talking like what I have been talking about. I was just sharing my childhood, and uh, and he leaped up. I actually, I was, you know, when you were so busy talking, you don't see that until, you, and he was just screaming and screaming, and all these people were just standing up and looked at him like, who is this guy? Is he an institution? Or, and. And then suddenly, and then I begin to pay attention in what he was saying. I actually couldn't know what he was saying, but he was calling my name. He was vindictive. He was angry. He was. It, it, had he had some weapon, he probably shoot me. Um, um, I do not know what prompted him to be uh, to be so angry at me. I was just sharing my story. It was a story I lived, and uh, it was a story that I have a privy to. And this is, damn it, this is San Francisco. This is America. I have the right to speak what is truthful, what is honest. And um, how, do I, how do I deal with that? My publicist said that I deal with it very well. I simply ignored it <laughs> as if it didn't happen. Do you have any idea how old that guy is? He was a <coughs> younger guy than I am. <coughs> yeah, that's my point. Is that I really, you know, right. respect your experience, your story, you know, your experience, right. what happened to you and to your father. Right. But my point is that, you know, because people grow up from different backgrounds, sure. different areas. I accept and, that. You know, I, I think the point is that we, we just need to respect Right. Each other, you know, right. Different stories. Different I, is, I respect him by my silence. I say, you can go outside and shout to the sky, the San Francisco Bridge. It might shake a little bit, but uh, um, so I respect him. Yeah. He may grow up in a different. He, Maybe. I don't know. He probably um, had a bad day. I don't know. Maybe that's all. You know, get a little boo boo here. I don't know. <laughs> I, it doesn't concern me. I. Uh, uh, and uh, there was, uh, I was on Diane Rim, I was on uh, Terry Gross, uh, Fresh Air. And there was one person who was eight, uh, was anyway, young, young person from China who was a student here at uh, Harvard uh, School of uh, uh, Government. And she is. <coughs> Very well educated, you know. She was studying politics at Harvard, and then um, she called up on the, and this is the show that was listened by four million people, and Terry Gross 
and she was going at me, going at me in questioning. Instead of questioning me, asking me a question, she was making a statement after, after that. And then Terry Gross said, time is running out. How old are you? And she said, I'm 18. <laughs> so Terry Gross said, do you even know what cultural revolution was? So anyway, and I really appreciate people who are, are fair, giving me my fair shot uh, to tell my story. And that's all I ask for. <clears throat> and they will have theirs. They can write their memoir. Colors of Bloody Mountain, <laughs> or whatever. So, um, so can you give us some like a detailed uh, historic uh, background about uh, the things happened, such as like uh, you said, uh, your uncle, uncle, whoever, was killed in 1945 by Red Army or something like that. So I just don't quite understand that kind of Right. In 1949, yeah. It's 45 or 49? 49, yeah. I don't have to understand what's that. And secondly, so when would be officially defined as cultural revolution? And yeah. uh, what, when it happened to your father? He was beating and the subject. Right. Uh, cultural revolution, officially, like uh, the definition. Cultural revolution started in 1965. And in 1976, when Chairman Mao died. Oh. Yes. Perhaps I, my memory is wrong. I guess happened officially in 1966. And uh, yeah, right. something like that. And uh, I just wonder, yeah, your story is so typical in China. I'm very sure. typical, exactly. Very typical. It's lived by a billion people. Uh, what I'm one of the few fortunate kind of story? get to tell the story, yes. yes. What do you imply about this kind of story and what kind of deep things you want to state by just t telling this kind of story, which I guess everybody in China can have their own story during, during that right. kind of time. So what, what do I you really want to imply about this? What do I imply? Um, I... Uh, imply nothing. I, uh, I just wanted to, uh, uh, like I explained, I, I want to write so that my daughter can grow up because my daughter was born in Poughkeepsie and um, <laughs> happy meals. <laughs> <laughs> and she, um, she doesn't understand where daddy came from. I, as a father, are you a mother? Yes, sure. Good. Um, I, I feel I love her very much, and uh, that love is very deep. And uh, it's not enough that you feed her happy meals. It's not enough that you buy her bicycle. Who I am, who I was, is who she is and who she will be. I want her to understand me so that she will understand herself, become a fuller woman, a braver woman. Because I'm hoping that by telling the story to her and my son, they will They will come to know what it means to be a human being. And uh, it's a family story. It's a story written by a nobody, about a nobody. But, uh, and you were right, it's a story lived by a billion. The revolution was prevalent, was uh, throughout the, that 10 years. A f millions died, and the country was brought to the ruiners, ruins, brink of bankruptcy. Schools were closed, and uh, um, and I just wanted to uh, to tell my children that. Maybe, maybe just by reaching out to one person that tomorrow will be a better day 
for one little skinny country boy somewhere and doesn't necessarily have to be in China, in Africa, in Turkey, in Turkey. It's a very simple wish. It's a father's wish and um, it's a family story. It doesn't have a big political scheme. I'm not a Harvard economics professor. I'm not a um, PhD in any of the political science. It's not a, um, it's, a, it's just a uh, family memoir. A memoir, what is a memoir? A memoir is a, uh, could be a glimpse of one's life. Memoir of a person, of a day that takes place or, or of a person's life. So uh, it's really, uh, there are hundreds of thousands of books being published in America. You know, I don't think um, many people too, pay too much attention to uh, what the book implies or and, and that sort of thing. You know, I don't think you should take too serious of something like that. Yeah, that's okay. That's yeah. Yeah, you assume right. Yeah, I assume like that. It's not very important. And, uh, I just wonder if anybody can be misguided. You can too. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, you mentioned three good friends of yours who helped sustain you through the very difficult growing up period. Right. Where are your friends now? My friends, uh, one of them uh, is selling shoes in Johannesburg in Af South Africa. And one of them became a banker. Uh, he took over his father's job. And uh, the other, he spent some time in jail and he came out again. So, uh, you know, it's like uh, the, the, uh, the specimen of any human beings. And, you know, I, we, sometimes we still talk on the phone and we marvel at the fact that we are actually fathers. And we are actually... Uh, we actually survived, you know, you know, we used to be muddy and scrawny and poor kids who deal with uh, muds and uh, manures, you know, most of the time. And, and that's, um, that's um, I guess, a victory of human dignity and humanity. Yes. Mm, would you care to comment on the current uh, literature environment in China. Um, would you recommend some good authors or maybe good books? You know, uh, actually, uh, I'm ashamed to say that I am not very uh, uh, familiar with uh, the current literary trend there. Some professors in our audience will be a much better uh, uh, source of information and wisdom. I tell you, talk to Professor Chia. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> she has <laughs> yeah. Well, yes. Uh, what was the picture painted of the rest of the world when you were younger in China? What was the... Uh, what was the picture? It was, um, we didn't know very much about the rest of the world and uh, we, um, I think we are fearful of the rest of the world. And, um, we were too hungry to care about anything, really. That's right. um, we were uh, not a great deal. Later on, maybe in the university? Or? Oh, yeah. And then uh, I think I still remember that the day when um, the streets were, street walls were pasted with posters welcoming President Nixon's uh, visit uh, to China. And I think that was the beginning of uh, something, uh, beginning of the opening the door and... I guess that time typically the Chinese impression about the outside, just say we were the best world in the whole world. Mm -hmm. Right? Any more questions? I think so. There's something like that, because it's like that. They're like uh, the, the two thirds of the world would be a really deep, like a trouble, hungry, <coughs> starvation or something like that. Yeah, yes, well, she, she's right. right. You know, I'm older than you are. I was educated as a China with the best system. Yes. Two thirds of the world yeah. is waiting for us to liberate them. Yeah. 
And my high school even changed its name, my high school, as the Third World, World of War Military School. <laughs> Well, as is often the case, uh, we, we've uh, invited a, a speaker who is uh, excited and intrigued all of us so much so that we want to continue the discussion all evening. And but I'm afraid we have work safety standards where we don't allow our speaker to become physically exhausted. Uh, so actually, what we'd like to do uh, perhaps is uh, we can adjourn to the comments. We actually have some refreshments if you want to continue uh, our discussion. But thank you very much for sharing. With us.